This is possibly what I'm going to do today. I wanted to tell you how some of us, uh, thousands of us actually, call ourselves geeks, are hackers, not crackers. Crackers are criminals, but we are hackers. And we do a lot of things, we enjoy life. We quietly sit in our labs or rooms or houses or are on the bed and are committed to enhance the values of the community in a big way. And we also, of course, want to change the world. But uh, usually changing the world, as you would mean, you know, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of tears, and it's being difficult. And usually you need a lot of courage. And courage would mean that you don't have uh, or you're afraid because you fear, you have a fear. So these are the things that come to your mind. So that's actually the reason why today I've come here to talk to you about certain alternative ways in which uh, you can change the world. And I also want to start with by telling you about a success story of those uh, approaches and attempts. So I, I'm sure all of you are into using computers in one way or the other. And every one of you are actually doing that. And sometimes unknowingly, because uh, many people do not even consider, for example, a mobile phone as a computer. They may not even think about the set-top box as a computer, or their vehicles that they drive as computers have come to a computer. Thanks to Volkswagen episode recently, that people started thinking that, OK, there are computers in the cars as well. OK, so uh, something happened 30 years ago, approximately 32 years ago. And this is what happened. So there's a guy called Richard Stallman, a geek. He's a hacker, a software computer operating system designer at MIT, Boston. And what did he do? He invented what is called copyleft. In fact, uh, of course, as a software programmer, he does a lot of things. He wrote uh, uh, the GCC compiler, world's most popular C programming compiler. And today it's called a compiler collection. And he also ri written several other languages. He has written an editor called Emacs, which is a favorite for a lot of geeks to program in Emacs and things like that. But apart from all that, though all of them are very interesting things, but this is what I consider the most important uh, hack that he did. So a hack is an idea as our uh, youngest boy in this auditorium told us, that a hack is actually creating that hole in the cloud. So that's what Richard Stallman did. And what he did essentially is that all of you know what is copyright. So copyright, though it talks about a right, it's a restriction. It's a restriction of the users, not to copy, not to use it in any other ways other than the ones that have been granted to you. But copyleft, on the other hand, starts by using the same law, because copyright is available all over the world. Every government, every legislation, anywhere in the world respects copyright. So that's what the hole that Richard Stallman found. The hole that he found was that I will use copyright, but I will write Richard Stallman copyright 1981, and then say the following. Say that this program can be used by anybody for any purpose, and you can make modifications to it, and you can share the modifications to anybody, provided, provided you continue to use the same copyright on all the distributions that you do. And that's a simple idea that transformed a lot of things in the computer science and computer world. And soon, another colleague is a, is a geek lawyer. Um, and he joined hands with uh, Richard Stallman and wrote general public license. Of course, the very first license, the first version, was written by Richard himself. And Richard is not a lawyer. He's just a computer geek. And then version 2 and version 3 were written with the help from Eben Moglen, who currently runs a very important uh, society called the Software Freedom Law Center uh, in New York. And he, of course, uh, the point that uh, they're talking about is that when we, whenever we talk about uh, free here, 
uh, it clearly says that we are talking about free as in freedom. So we are talking about software freedom here at this moment. But I will later on tell you what other freedoms that it uh, extends to. So these are the four freedoms that Richard has refined. So you can actually replace the software in this with anything, any other creative or cultural artifact that you produce. It could be a book, it could be a poem, it could be an art, it could be a music, it could be whatever that you produce and these are the freedoms that you want. One of the most important thing is that it is up to us as citizens to use any cultural artifact in a creative way. That's the creative freedom that you, and that is why it is called the zeroth freedom. The first freedom that you get is to use it for whichever purpose you like it. And the second freedom is the freedom to understand how it works. In the case of software, you need to interpret how it works. And for that, you need source code. So in the case of free software, what happens is that if you make software, it is very important for you to release the source code of the software. And the third important freedom, of course, is that you have the freedom to make changes to the software. And the fourth one is also very important, which is that whatever changes you do can also be distributed, provided all these four freedoms are granted to everybody. And this is uh, a kind of a pun. And once you release like that, anywhere in the country, any legislation in the country must respect, under the copyright law, the copyleft statement. And that is the whole that Richard Stallman found in the cloud. And then he announced uh, an operating system project called the GNU. The GNU is not Unix, is how the Kersu acronym expands. And so he announced, said thing that now that people are going to use computers all over the world, it is very important that we need a free operating system for all of us. And so he started making the operating system along with the number of hackers started putting together. But something interesting happened from 1984 to almost uh, uh, for the next decade that internet actually also started happening. And people started having mailing lists and people have FTP servers, HTTP servers and things like that. And in the process, these geeks not only made the internet, but they also used it. And used it to build an operating system, which is free. And then some important component of this operating system, which was missing, was developed by Linus Thorvalds, and that is the Linux, the kernel of an operating system. Now, once you have it, you have a free operating system for everybody. And now, this operating system, of course, is uh, available to all the people all over the world today, and almost everyone who is using computers is directly or indirectly using this operating system even though they may not know that they are using this operating system. Okay, so these are some of the famous distributions using which these operating systems go out and reach out to the various people. And of course, apart from these operating systems which are being distributed, there are a large number of applications that are being there. I, I'm sure some of you must be using many of these applications. Very likely, you may be using Firefox browser or VLC music player or Audacity to edit, or there are many other applications that you may actually be able to see. And these are the most popular applications, but apart from that, they have made almost every application. Today we have something like 40,000 free software applications that are released and made by the geeks all over the world, and for every purpose. And all of them grant you the freedom to modify as well. And now comes an important story, and that is that this particular copyleft freedom that Richard Stallman invented did not end only with software. So people have got together and, s and said that if, if software is possible to be made, why can't we make knowledge in the same way? And that is what uh, Jimmy Wales, along with uh, Sanger and Cunningham, they got together and made something called this. Something very interesting that happens with Wikipedia. And as I said, if you really want to do something very simple and follow the wiki way, wiki has a very interesting uh, sense. Suppose if I say, call somebody from behind and say, you know, come fast here. How do I say it? Come fatafat. So that's what we say in Hindi, fatafat. I speak Telugu. In Telugu, I say gaba gaba. You know, come gaba gaba. That's my mother tongue. And similarly, in Spanish, in a, in a particular version of Spanish, actually, 
uh, in a Cuban kind of island, people use wiki wiki. So if you have to call somebody from there, say, come wiki wiki. And that is the idea here. Now what is the idea here? Create a website and keep a page open and let anybody come and edit. And let them create more pages and make links between them. And that's the technology that has been developed. And this technology was invented by Cunningham. And Cunningham, Sanger, and Bill, uh, the, uh, the Jimmy Wales, and all of them got together and created such a most successful free software, free knowledge website running with the idea of copyleft. That all of you can actually share knowledge with the condition that you will continue to share the knowledge forever. And that is the important idea because of which the, the Wikipedia knowledge came. I don't have to tell you how successful Wikipedia is. The fifth most popular website is Wikipedia. But which are the next popular websites we'll just come to know very shortly. Okay, so uh, then uh, an important thing happened that another geek lawyer, like uh, uh, I mentioned one geek lawyer earlier. Now we have another geek lawyer joining here. This is Larry Lessig, who is incidentally standing for the Republic, uh, uh, de democratic uh, presidential post in the United States, uh, asking for certain important uh, constitutional amendments. And so who is Larry Lessig? L Larry Lessig invented what is popularly called the Creative Commons. So Creative Commons is a very big uh, way of sharing uh, your cultural resources to all the people. Just like Wikipedia has now been released uh, by the Creative Commons license. And software is being released under Creative Commons license. Movies have been made and released under Creative Commons license, and so on and so forth. So this is a new revolution that happened. And something interesting happened that Larry Lessig collaborated with an young boy who was 15 years old. And this was Aaron Swatch. And what did he do? Aaron Swatch has an interest about digital libraries. And he wanted to see the internet as a digital library. And if internet is a digital library, how do you catalog? How do you index? And then he invented what is today called the RSS, which is a syndication framework for all the digital resources that are on the net. It's a very inspiring story to, to read uh, about the various kind of things that he has done. He's a freedom fighter. He fought for internet freedom, for net neutrality, and a lot of things. And he managed to make amends to American uh, regulations at the time when internet freedom was not going to be granted. And so, so these are the important uh, contributions that all these guys were doing. While all these changes were happening, it's a big revolution because it impacted a lot of people. Starting from simple uh, wa uh, wristwatches to supercomputers, the operating system has encroached all over the world. But something embarrassing happened. And the biggest embarrassment to the free software movement has been, for example, Google. Why it's an embarrassment? It's an embarrassment because Google uses the same operating system for their business. They also develop a lot of software. And one of the most important embarrassment is because that they use copyleft software. But since, as a single agency, they don't have the obligation to release it because they're not distributing the software. So Google found a hole in the copyleft idea and then created a big empire. All of you know the success of Google. I don't have to tell you what Google did. But most of the people think that Google is an email company, or maybe some of them think that, OK, it's a search engine company, and things like that. It's not. It's, a, it's, it's, it's founded by statisticians. So they are, it, they are basically converted. Uh, they wanted data from all of you. And that's basically the thing. And of course, you know about Facebook and WhatsApp as well. Now, what is it that they're doing? And possibly this is how you'll understand better. So how many paid employees do they have? Of course, you can find it out. You can go to their websites and find out how many employees do they have, what is their strength, and how much salaries do they give, and so on and so forth. But one thing that we don't realize is that almost every user is working free of charge for these companies each one of you who have accounts on all of them. Why? Because every time you write something and use their services, every time you download something from their website, every time you ask a question on the search engine, they are continuously profiling you. And they, their capital 
their investment is your time and your expression and your time is their capital but the problem is that we are not the stakeholders of that company and that is one of the biggest problems of this and this has been a biggest embarrassment for us because we know that the so those super fast servers are actually using free software but what happened at the end is that they are snatching away the digital freedom of the citizens the privacy was at stake i don't know how many of you know who is edward snowden edward snowden has told us recently of course we we knew it already before but then he gave the evidence that all these companies were giving the data all our private data to nsa the united states security agency so while there is a good story there is also uh, an embarrassing story to tell about this world and so what do we do so doing this kind of a thing what what kind of a thing can we do we of course want to have a digital india right but what kind of a digital india do we want to build okay so there are three options the kind of empire that you can build on the left hand side represents a centralized digital architecture you create a large database like what the facebook and google and all these big companies do create a large database and collect a lot of information and create a lot of wealth and then do some kind of service uh, in the name of free service you can you can of course capture everybody's data that is one option the middle path is a distributed architecture where you create a distributed system and create local networks and connect all the local networks and the third option is a peer to peer network where every machine connects to every one of us let me pause a little bit and actually give you one important example all of us have cell phones here and every cell phone has receiving as well as transmitting radio which essentially means that if i want to send a message to you you will be able to transmit and take the message directly but that doesn't happen suppose if i send an sms or a email to you it goes somewhere else if i actually send an email it is very likely that it goes out of the country and comes back to you after a second now that is not the kind of infrastructure that is sustainable because we unnecessarily of course have to pay the for the entire bandwidth either we pay it or the isp pays it ultimately that is the way how it is but the point is that the peer to peer networks demonstrate that it is actually possible for all of us to connect to each other and then talk among us including sending emails as well as other kinds of messages including files so that kind of a peer to peer protocols are already been developed by the geeks and the hackers but we need to use such kind of software in order to create the new kind of uh, d- digital environment that we want to create now so this is the kind of question that we want to ask here so if we want to grant freedom and power to the people because that is what i understand what democracy is democracy is not just to gain power and then start ruling the whole world democracy is about granting power and freedom to the citizens and if if we have to do that if i have to use digital technology to do that what would possibly i have to do i have to use possibly wiki media kind of interface for the government of india because that is where the transparency is possible because every change that everybody does is documented and today we have right to information but why do we need a right to information that is because the government doesn't feel the responsibility to share the information and if they really have the responsibility to share the information we don't need a uh, right to information at all the fact that they are keeping most of the important data from us in a secret way an inaccessible way and in a kind of a format that you can't even digitize it and that is why we needed a, an act like this for justice so that is one of the important reason why we have to find alternatives we have to find alternatives of this kind and of course geeks have shown us the way now the, the point i wanted to say is on one hand you have the the model of facebook uh you know um, whatsapp or google and on the other hand you have wikimedia you have gnu linux operating system you have various other options now which way do you want to choose i mean you may think that it's a pragmatic question i have a choice but to me 
if you really are interested in uh, making sure that we want to have a democratic society, I think there is no choice. We have only one way to go, and that is that we have to stop using proprietary operating system, which is dangerous, because we know that it is dangerous. The only operating system that propagates viruses is this operating system. And the free operating system is more secure, and so it is better that we migrate to a free operating system. It is already made by us, and we have been using it for the last, uh, I am using it for the last 21 years, and many others have been using and making it for several years. And the whole world is knowingly or unknowingly using it because 75% of all the servers that are running on the internet run on this operating system. Including operating systems are also on the satellites and the spacecrafts. And my appeal to you is to use a browser that doesn't track your records. Do not log in when you are searching on the net. So our use uh, search engines which are free and the source code of these search engines is also available. You can go to GitHub and download and find out exactly what they're doing. And of course, very important, there are a large number of distributed Facebook social networking sites. Now, distributed social networking sites does not let data to come at one place so that the statisticians can start tracking you and start predicting your behavior and making your profiles. And that is very important. And of course, that uh, it is not uh, against any kind of business. All of them make business, including Telegram, for example. Telegram is already making a lot of money, but without tracking you, without making any kind of thing. So in Telegram, if you use, you'll, you'll be able to send encrypted communication, and they don't store any data, unlike WhatsApp. One la WhatsApp stores all the data that you are sending from one person to the other, and whereas Telegram doesn't do that. And Telegram software and the source code is, of course, also available on the Git repositories all over the world. And so we have the kind of uh, options that we have available here. Now, do we create a centralized, authoritative kind of repositories using digital computers? Because that is possible. Or you want to create a distributed network of computers, which is also possible. Or do you want to create uh, a network of peer-to-peer -peer computers? And it is known that a complete peer-to-peer -peer computers is not so efficient. And that is why, one of the reasons why at Homi Baba Center, we want to network all the schools and colleges of the country, because we work in education. And for that, we want to build a network of this kind, where within the school and within the college, we will have a peer-to-peer -peer network, and then we network the, all the colleges and the schools as a kind of a network, and then what you get is a peer-to-peer -peer network of colleges, but within the colleges you have a peer-to-peer -peer network of all the agencies. And this is the model that we have been interested, and we are still hacking the problem. We already have a solution, but I am sure that some of you may want to contribute and join us, and the source code of all our products are available on the GitHub and in other Git repositories all over the world. So you may be able to get into that kind of a thing. And one important point I would like to say, I have actually stated in whatever I said today uh, about one model. And that model requires you to make something, share whatever you have made, and then what is most important is to seek feedback from everybody. And that is very important. Because when you publish it online, on a Wikipedia, or in a GitHub, or in a Git repository, you, let, you get a lot of feedback from everybody. And that feedback is very important. That is when you are inviting other people to contribute and be part of it. That's when the collaboration begins. And so here, the point that I wanted to say is that this is not just a model for digital society. It's the same model that works for energy. It's the same model that works for finance, for anything. If you want really a, a sustainable society, you have to localize things. You have to decentralize. And you have to work in small numbers and prevent any kind of centralization that happens. Any kind of centralization that happens anywhere in the world is vulnerable. And that is the word that we need to understand. We are going to really create a kind of a vulnerable society. So that's why, so this is what I thought I would uh, uh, appeal to you to join us, become hackers and not crackers, and be part of uh, uh, building up a sustainable, free digital India without tears and without fear. Thank you so much.